Hi everyone, my name is Vasiliki Gokhan and today we're going to discuss about child abuse and bullying. This video will be in two parts. In the first part we are going to focus on child abuse, the forms of child abuse and the effects that child abuse can have on the child. And we're also going to discuss about how therapy can be beneficial. In the second part we're going to focus on bullying, the forms of bullying and the effects of bullying and what parents should and should not do, and what the child should and should not do. So let's begin with the first part. So what are the differences between child abuse and bullying? Well, bullying is a more open form of aggression, whereas child abuse can be hidden, maybe emotional child abuse, like neglect. But definitely both of them stem from misuse of power. Let's move on now to the forms of child abuse. Well, we have emotional, like neglect, as we said, or manipulation or fear. We might have physical, like punching, kicking or biting. We might have verbal insults or threats. And we might also have sexual, so inappropriate behavior towards the child. One in four girls and one in eight boys will actually fall victim of sexual abuse before the age of 18. So you can understand how important it is for us to address this. Let's move on now to the effects that child abuse can have on the child. Well, we have emotional, so the child might have a lower self-esteem. They might think also that it's their fault of what exactly is happening to them. They might feel guilty because of that. And the effects might be immediate, so during that time period, or they might be more long-term. We might find that when they are adults, they might have difficulties forming relationships or reaching certain goals. If the trauma is quite severe, then we might have suicidal ideation. But definitely both emotional and physical abuse can lead to trauma during adolescence or childhood or later on in adulthood. Emotional abuse might not be intentional, but it can definitely cause damage. Let's focus now more on neglect because neglect can lead to severe negative consequences. So imagine that a child is placed in a confined space with no drinks, no food, no clothing. That child will live in fear within the family unit. They will think that no one loves them and they will not receive the love and affection that every child during that age should receive. As such, the emotional symptoms might also, as we said, be that there is low self-esteem, low confidence. They might also start uh, withdrawing from school or being more socially reserved. That child might also not vocalize, so they might not speak up. And that might be for many different reasons. One might be that, for instance, because they were behaving as children, for instance, they were screaming and shouting or they were making noise, they were being punished because of that. So maybe they have made the association between speaking up and being punished. So they will think that, okay, if I make noise, if again I say my opinion, again I will be punished by someone because that's exactly what has been happening. So that child will, ha will have lack of communication with others. They will not open up, they will not trust other individuals. Now let's move on to why the child might not report the abuse. Well, the child might think that this is my fault, they will be self-blaming, therefore there's no point of me reporting that. That might have been also reinforced by the parent because when they are punishing them, they might also be telling them that it's your fault that this is happening. Another reason might be that they do not understand that they're victims of abuse. So they might actually think that my parents are doing everything for me. They're doing the best for me. Another reason might be that they really do love their parents. So they might think that if I do report this, if I do tell someone, if I do tell the authorities, then my parents will be taken away from me and what will happen to me. So they will accept the situation as it is and the abuse will continue. One other factor might be that they have associated the punisher with a grown up. So they might think that if I do tell the authorities, if I do tell another grown up, what will happen is that they will blame me and they will punish me because that's exactly what has been happening up until now. Now, who is more at risk? Well, children who live in a family that is their house is more isolated, then the abuse might be more frequent and more easy to happen because there are no neighbors to report anything. Another factor might be that they live in poverty, so that puts them more at risk. 
Another reason might also be that there's abuse between the partners or the carers, therefore that might take a toll on the child as well. The child might also get physically abused, like punching or kicking. Another factor might be that the parent or the carer has been abused themselves when they were children, therefore they do not know what love and affection is because they have not received that. Another reason might be, for instance, that the parent or the carer is taking drugs or is consuming alcohol. Therefore, their inhibitory control will be altered and the physical abuse might be more easy to happen. The child might be more at risk because the parent is consuming drugs. Of course, if the child is also taking drugs or if they're also drinking, that might make them be in situations that it's more easy for them to receive the abuse because they will be drowsy, they will not have the same responses, then what will happen is that the abuse might happen more easily. So those are some of the reasons why certain children might be more at risk. Now let's move on to therapy and how therapy can be beneficial. Well, through therapy, the individual might get a different perspective. They might also learn about the boundaries and what behavior is acceptable. As we said, certain children, when they are victims of abuse, they might not know that they are the victims. So by knowing what behavior is acceptable, they might actually realize that I have been the victim of abuse, therefore the healing process will start. They might also stop self-blaming, the guilt might be reduced, and what will increase is self-image and self-worth. Communication is also very vital within therapy. So the child might understand that communicating, opening up and trusting other people might not be so bad. So they might start forming relationships more easily. The therapist might also ask about the coping skills that the child has been using, the pros and cons. So for instance, if a child has been using as a coping skill drinking, then together they might come to the conclusion that actually this is not a very good coping skill. Maybe I should do something else. The therapist might also inquire about the support system. This is very important for the therapist overall so that they know that the child is safe. But by doing that, the child will also remember that actually I do have my parents if the parents are not the abusers. I do have teachers. I do have my friends. So they will not feel alone because when they do fall victims of abuse, what will happen is that they will feel very lonely. They will have depressed symptoms, as we said. So the parent, if they are not the abusers, then they might also be present within therapy. By doing that, the parent might also realize and understand how they can respond, what they could say to the child when they, the child goes to them and tells them that that happened at school or that other family member did that to me. It's very important here to remember as a parent not to overreact. Of course, it's very difficult to do that because when you hear that your child has been abused um, and has fallen victim of abuse, then it's very, very easy for you to feel um, very th threatened by everyone. You might want to protect your child at all costs, but it's very important not to do that because if the child sees that you are also having this emotional reaction, they might not want to open up again because they will think that if I do that, my parent will become sad. So communication again between the child and the parent through therapy is also very vital. So validating the emotions of the child, both the therapist and the parent, is very important. You need to remind the, the child that what they're doing right now is very brave. They can open up. What they're feeling is not abnormal. It's actually very normal to feel like that if anyone were to be placed in the same situation and were to fall victims of abuse, that's exactly what they would be feeling. So the child might stop self-blaming and they might think that actually this is not me, this is not because of me. And they will accept and again, as I said, the healing process will start. The use of language is also very important within therapy. You need to remember that the child feels very ashamed. They might also feel embarrassed of what has been happening to me, especially if the abuse might be from a parent. They might feel that it's very embarrass embarrassing to say that to someone. If they have also been sexually abused, they might think that it's their fault. So again, shame will be there and guilt. 
So again, you need to remind them that it's not them. They need to reach the conclusion that they have been the victims of abuse and it's not because of them, of what exactly has been happening. Now, what happens if the child does not communicate at all? If they have internalized all the incidents of abuse and therefore they do not know how to open up or how to vocalize? Well, some indicators, some behaviors that we might see include increased aggressiveness. We are going to talk more about that in the second part of how someone who has been the victim of abuse might start bullying other people or might be abusing other people as well. But this is one indicator. They will also feel sad. They might also have certain sleeping difficulties or some nightmares. So those are some of the indicators that you can tell that the child is being abused if they're not able to talk in the more traditional function of talking therapy. So what can the therapist do in that case? Well, there are some other options, for instance, storytelling. So the therapist might start a story, which is of course around the problem that the child is experiencing, and the child can continue that story. So what will happen through that is that the child will learn not to identify with a problem and they will also gain a different perspective. They will think of different things that they could have done and what they can do in the future. Another one might be play therapy. So the therapist might give a toy to the child and that toy will signify the child and the child might be asked to speak for the toy. Therefore, the child will learn how to respond to certain situations by doing that. So that's it with the first part of this video. We discussed about child abuse and we brought the forms of child abuse and of course the effects of child abuse. We also talked about therapy and how therapy can be beneficial, about the importance of use of language within therapy. And we also discussed about different ways that the therapist might approach the child if they're not able to communicate in the more traditional function of talking therapy. If you are interested in bullying and the effects of bullying and of course the forms of bullying, do tune in in the second part of this video. Thank you.